And this is Weaponized. Weaponized. Everybody hearing about this, so what is the difference? Animals are killed at, by predators all the time. Right. There's signature things. Why, why is this even worth investigation? What are the key hallmarks of a uh, that you saw repeatedly, case by case, repeated that tells you this is something other than normal predatory animals? Give me a laundry list. Tell me what you've seen. Well, the uh, the the first obvious uh, difference is that a predator, when they attack uh, a cow, you know, whether it be coyotes or wolves or or whatever predator, uh, cats. Um, there's a lot of mess, you know, they open up the abdomen, they open up, you know, various parts of the animal, and there's a huge amount of blood on the, on the grass, there's a lot of entrails spread around, I mean, we've seen this, uh, so, so it's, uh, it's pretty obvious. Complete contrast with a, with a cattle mutilation is there's usually pretty precise cuts around the anus, for example, would be cored out, you can see the edges of the wounds on the hide, and they're very sharp edges. I mean, it looks like some kind of a scalpel or a surgical instrument has been used. Um, a lot of the time you see eyes removed, and you see a sort of a, a, a really sharp cut around the eyes. We've even looked at the, the hair on, on the, under a microscope of around the eyes, and you can see how, how crisp the cuts are from around the eyes. Ears are, are a lot of the time lopped off. Sometimes, you know, the ear carries a, a, a plastic ear tag that the rancher uses to identify the animal. A lot of time that plastic ear tag is gone, but the, the clean slice through the ear is very, very different, um, you know, from uh, predators. Now, even, even birds sometimes can, can, can cause sharp cuts, but not the plethora of sharp cuts that are very, very distinctive around the animal. The next really sort of defining characteristic is usually lack of blood. You know, when, when, when you got cats or coyotes or wolves attacking cows, you know, the mess is unbelievable. Um, in many of these cases that we investigated, there's really no blood um, in the animal or underneath the animal or on the animal. So um, now that's not all cases, but it's some cases. Um, we had a we had a case that's been well documented in uh, on the Skinwalker Ranch in Utah, for example, where you know an 84 pound calf that had been born the night previously um, was found dead on the pasture. The rancher and his wife had tagged this animal just 45 minutes pr uh, prior. They were still in the pasture and sort of maybe 200 300 yards away and they, their dog started acting up. So they went to investigate and they found the mother of the calf that had been, they had just tagged, uh, dragging its feet and sort of acting very strangely. They came upon this calf that they had tagged 45 minutes previously. The calf was spread out on the pasture and there are photographs on the internet of this. Uh, we did a full report and we published it many times, um, but the calf was like spread eagled out on the, on the pasture um, all four legs, well, three legs were sort of spread out. One of the legs was, was about 10 feet away from the animal. But the interesting thing was that we flew up on Robert Bigelow's private jet. We were standing over that animal within seven hours of death. Um, so the animal was still fresh. I mean, you could see the animal's uh, pinkish flesh was not a drop of blood in the animal. Its entire body cavity was empty. All you could see was the sort of the spine running down from head to, head, head to stern of the animal and the, uh, the legs were, were spread out. It was almost like um, the uh, calf had been very carefully laid on the grass, um, not a drop of blood in the animal, underneath the animal. We actually went to the trouble of going to the local abattoir. We got four liters of blood just in case, you know, this a lot of blood had, had sort of seeped into the ground and disappeared. Um, it had not rained during that period, so there was really no way that the, the uh, blood had been washed off. But the thing was, not a single drop of blood on the animal. When we poured gr uh, blood on that grass, it was obvious. It was so obvious. 
The Gormans were especially sensitive because of the losses they'd already suffered. Out of a herd of 80 cattle, they lost 14 head prior to the arrival of Nids. Some disappeared, others were sliced up. 12 more cows and calves were killed while Nids was on the ranch. Their neighbors, the Garcias, lost several animals as well. Some of their cattle appeared to have been killed by being dropped onto the pasture from a great height. The cattle mutilation mystery has been reported in at least 15 states dating back to the 1960s. Thousands of animals have been sliced up with surgical precision, mostly under the cover of darkness. If humans are doing it, not a single suspect has ever been caught. For the Gormans, the livestock losses were devastating, both financially and psychologically. And then things got worse. On March 10, 1997, Tom Gorman and his wife walked out of their home and into the pasture, planning to tag the ears of several calves that had been born in the preceding days. It was a bright, clear morning. Snow was on the ground. Fifty yards from their house, they found the first calf. Was they were with their, their dog. Uh, the, the two of them um, tagged and weighed this animal. They, they checked it at, I believe it was 84 pounds, or 87 pounds. And they left the animal there. With the, with the mother, everything seemed to be fine, although they did detect an odor in the air around this uh, area. They, they, they detected a strong musk smell. Um, they took note of it, and then they headed west, and they went about 300 yards west beyond, the, the dog run was, is not, was not there at the time, but about 300 yards beyond, um, towards where that incline is, um, and they were tagging a second animal. Only 30 to 40 minutes had passed. The Gormans had an unobstructed view of everything in the field, but didn't see or hear anything unusual until their dog focused its attention back toward the house and the first calf. The dog with them down here at this stage began to act really strangely. It started growling, the hair on the back of its neck went up, and it started facing back towards here growling and snarling, and then it just took off west, away from this spot, it just took off. It was never seen again. The Gormans were curious and walked back across the field. First thing they saw was the mother of the animal was running back and forth, kind of in a, in a, um, a sort of half circle, from about this area to the fence line, just running back and forth, and it was limping. I mean, it was dragging its foot, it was limping. They met the animal um, and they noticed that it was just totally out of breath. It was panting, it was obviously in deep stress, and it was dragging one leg. And then they noticed the calf, or what was left of it. They spread eagle on the ground, just about here. With, uh, it, was, it was lying with all four limbs just spread on the ground. All of its internal body cavity was gone. Um, it was completely Pretty well, all of its uh, muscle was gone from, the, from the, the torso. The legs were still intact, but the, um, one of the ears was also gone. So they called NIDS. The rancher placed a call to the NIDS investigators who'd returned to Las Vegas for a rare weekend off. Within a few hours, a four-man team, including a veterinarian, was on the scene. Necropsy started. And the first thing that the veterinarian noticed during the necropsy was that the, the ear of the animal had been sliced off with a very sharp instrument, possibly a scalpel. And the ear had contained a very large plastic yellow um, tag, like a, a, um, an ear tag. That they had just put on. That they had just put on, and it was gone. So um, the necropsy proceeded. Um, up about 10 feet away from the animal, there was a femur. One of the femurs had been forcibly ripped out of a ball and socket joint, which is extremely difficult to do, I mean, in terms of strength. It, was, it looked initially, you know, superficially, like a massive predator had just lain waste to this animal, removed, you know, 60 pounds of meat in 45 minutes, which we don't know of any predator that could have done that. And how could a predator inflict such carnage without being seen or heard by the rancher, his wife, or his dog, who were a few hundred yards away in the same field on what was a quiet Sunday morning? No four-legged predator known to science could do it. 
The team gathered tissue and bone samples, which were sent to three independent pathology labs. The results arrived later, but confirmed what seemed obvious in the pasture that day. The calf had been carved up by someone wielding sharp, metallic instruments. A heavy, machete-like object had slammed into the bones. A smaller, scalpel-like knife had sliced the hide and muscle. But closer inspection revealed that it was definitely sharp instruments used. There was no sign of blood. There was no sign of entrails around. It was perfectly clean. Um, not a drop of blood on the grass. We went even as far as doing an experiment by pouring blood on the grass to see how fast it would seep through. Videotaped the grass and showed, you know, even two days later you could still see the stain on the grass. So there was no blood whatsoever, not a single drop either underneath the animal, on the animal, or on the grass. It was just completely clean. A professional tracker was brought in. He scoured every inch of ground in and around the field, looking for tracks, human, animal, or vehicle. Nothing. Eventually, the investigators reached an unsettling conclusion. The bottom line is this animal must have been killed elsewhere because there was no blood. There was no blood on the scene, and then the animal must have been brought back, laid down carefully, almost, you know, really, almost ritually on the spot where it had been tagged. The NIDS team investigated dozens of mutilation cases across the country. Many of the tissue samples were analyzed in NIDS own lab in Las Vegas and then double checked by independent labs they hired. The Utah calf was in a category all its own. It seemed akin to psychological warfare intended to shock and frighten the witnesses. The following night there was another scare in the darkness of the first homestead. Shots were fired at something that had rattled the herd. Eventually, Colm Kelleher surmised that the perpetrators responsible for the calf were mechanical, like an assembly line in a meatpacking plant. A machine was involved with this carnage. Whatever happened to that calf um, was a, a, an extraordinarily skillful job.